Dr. John Torres here with NBC News covering on this Facebook Live some headlines you might have heard over the past couple of days, especially a couple of things from today, and getting a little bit behind them, getting in-depth into the story itself so you have a better understanding of what that headline and what that story means for you and what it particularly means to help you help the rest of us get through this pandemic and get it over with as soon as possible. So hopefully there's some things here that you can use in your own life that could help you out. On top of that, I like answering your questions, so please, if you have any questions, send them our way. But here are the headlines we're talking about today. You, you might have heard about uh, this uh, study that came out of Australia saying that the virus can live on surfaces for up to 28 days. And that's exactly what they found in the study. But they found it under very particular conditions. And so here's the basic, the, the, head, the whole thing behind it. So as a laboratory in Australia, what they did is they got the virus, they put it in essentially artificial mucus, and then they put it on different surfaces. They kept looking at those surfaces every day to find out when they would no longer be able to grow the virus. Now that's important because in the past other people have looked at surfaces to find out if they could find virus part particles on the surface the difference there being if you can find virus particles it might be just parts of the virus that aren't even viable won't live outside or aren't even alive anymore it's a dead virus but they're still finding it in this case what they did is they looked for a virus they could actually grow in a culture that was essentially viable that was a virus that could potentially spread to other people and spread to you and infect you and they found out that it lived on certain surfaces for up to 28 days in particular it it lasted that long on um phone surfaces on stainless steel and on banknotes they call them on dollar notes but they weren't plastic banknotes they were more banknotes like what we have here but a lot of caveats behind this and even they say this does not necessarily translate to your life because what they're saying is what they did here is they essentially did it in a laboratory in the dark the reason they did it in the dark is because we know uv light over time can kill the virus like it can most viruses so they said okay let's do it in the dark to see how long it can last overall and again, the three surfaces in particular, banknotes, which are, you know, basically, uh, like here in the U.S., they're made out of a certain type of, of fiber. They also found out on, smart, on phone surfaces itself, so basically just the glass part of the phone, and they also found it on stainless steel. But again, it was in the dark at 40 degrees centigrade, I mean, at 40, sorry, at 68 degrees Fahrenheit at room temperature. They did find if they increased the temperature to 40 degrees centigrade, which is also 104 Fahrenheit, it only lasted around 24 hours. They also noted that flu, they did a similar thing with the flu, and the flu itself lasted for 17 days. So the story here is a couple different things. One, we know the virus can last on surfaces. In ideal conditions for the virus, it can last almost a month on some surfaces, but in the real world, probably not that long. And other studies have shown that up to a maximum of like three to four days on some surfaces uh, is the amount of time it can last. But the overall story behind here for you is essentially you have to remember to keep washing your hands, especially before you touch your face and especially before you touch your mouth, your nose, or your eyes. Even though contact surfaces and touching your face isn't the most likely way you'll get coronavirus, it is one way you could possibly get coronavirus. And that's why I always talk about the four W's. You know, wear a mask, watch your distance, wash your hands, and then windows, ventilate. That washing your hands is important, and that's what this story is showing here. So again, if you look at the headlines, you see 28 days, and you think, oh my gosh, this virus can last forever on certain surfaces. But once you start looking at the study itself, ideal lab conditions, even the scientists said that they did not duplicate what happens in the real world. In the real world, we have sunlight. In the real world, people come through and clean every now and then. And so, again, it's not going to duplicate it, but it's going to give us that understanding that, yes, these, this virus can last on surfaces for hours, perhaps even days. We just need to be very careful and constantly wash our hands before we touch our face and then wash these surfaces again periodically. So that's one story. Another story is about the vaccine. And the vaccine itself, there's been a lot of uh, issues and a lot of people concerned about the vaccine and how much can they trust the vaccine because it's coming out so rapidly. And by the vaccine, I mean the multiple numbers of vaccines that are being tested and tried right now. So far, there are over 200 different vaccines being developed around the world. Here in the U.S., there are five that are considered to be frontline contenders for what we call the race to the vaccine. Another one, otherwise, the first ones to get the vaccine out. But people are saying, wait a minute, this is happening very quickly. And if you remember back in February, a lot of experts, including Dr. Fauci, said within 12 to 18 months, we should have a vaccine that we can start using on the general population. Well, 
Fast forward 12 to 18 months would be February time frame, and that's exactly what is looking like is going to happen, that we're going to start getting a vaccine around that time frame. More than likely, for the general population, you and I will probably be getting it sometime around April-ish time frame, you know, plus or minus a month or two there, because it's going to take time to, number one, get it through that phase three trial, get the emergency use authorization, keep the production going, which has already started, and get it distributed to people so that people can start getting vaccinated, inoculated against uh, COVID-19. But the concern is with a lot of people, and there is vaccine hesitancy out there, is, you know, can I trust this vaccine? Am I, is the government giving me all the information I need? Well, there's a group that just opened up that just got organized. They're calling themselves COVAT. COVAT stands for COVID-19 Vaccine Analysis Team. And these are a team of top vaccine experts from around the, glo- around the country here, and they've joined forces. And they're doing this independently outside the government. And what they want to do is they want to look at the vaccine data, analyze the data, and they're giving weekly briefings. And so hopefully, from my perspective, what they do is they make this a bit more transparent. They get the information they need from the companies as far as what's going on with their trials. They get the information that the FDA is getting for the emergency use authorization. So they can look at it independently and say, yes, we agree with the FDA, it should get emergency use authorization, and we agree that it's safe enough to use in a general population. And so, again, this thing is called COVAT, this organization, this group that has formed the COVID-19 Vaccine Analysis Team. They have just formed, they had just announced uh, their structure and announced the fact they're going to have these weekly media briefings. And so we'll hear more information about that and more thoughts on where they are. And some of these are scientists that I know and I trust. And so I'll keep you informed as well as to what this COVAT team is actually coming out with, what their thoughts are behind the vaccine, especially as we start getting closer to the vaccine being authorized and produced fully to the point where the general population can be using it. And so, again, to me, this is good news that we're getting an independent source, a group of experts. These are all what we call vaccinologists, vaccine experts. that can take a good look at this, good look at the data, and say we either need more data or we're okay with this data. It looks like it's safe, but we get the word on where we are with that. So that's with the vaccine. And the last one I want to talk about is what's going on in Europe right now and how that's an indicator of what could possibly happen here. Now, Europe, for a while had things under control. They had issues back in March and April like we did. They got things under better control, but different countries in Europe, kind of like different states here in the United States, opened up differently. Some countries said, okay, we look like, it looks like we're out of the woods. Let's go ahead and open up as best we can and people can go back to old habits and do the things that they did before and uh, we should be fine. Well, it turns out they weren't fine and they're having a huge upsurge in cases. Case in point, other countries in Europe didn't do that. They said, okay, we've got things under control, but we need to keep things under control. We're in for the long haul here. Let's keep a lot of these restrictions in place, a lot of these requirements in place, and see if we can keep coronavirus under control. And this gives us a good example of what can happen with different countries and what could potentially happen here, especially as we start getting into our winter months and we know coronavirus is going to become more active for a variety of reasons, mainly because we move indoors and the virus itself, as that one study I talked about early showed you, can last and live longer and is more viable in colder weather. The, uh, but looking at the different countries here, the main countries I want to look at, Spain, right now, and I'll go, I'll go per 100,000 cases, or per 100,000 population, because that makes everything essentially equal. If you look at Spain, right now there are around 20 cases per 100,000 population. France, around 20 to 22 cases per 100,000 population. United Kingdom, around 21, 22 cases for, per 100,000 population. That is... Um, those are the ones that essentially opened up very quickly. People started reverting to older habits, and the government didn't really look at it and say, okay, we need to keep things under control. Now, compare that to countries that kept things better under control, that basically said we're going to open up, but not that quickly and not that robustly because we want to make sure that we're in this for the long haul and we keep it under control. So, again, remember, those are in the 20 to 22 range. Germany right now, 5 per 100,000 cases. Portugal, 10 per 100,000 cases. Portugal's right next to Spain and close to France who are having those huge issues. And then if you look at Sweden, Sweden for a while had uh, a lot of bad press about what they were doing because they essentially opened up and said, hey, we're not going to really mandate things, but we think we can keep things under control. They had uh, surges in cases and surges in deaths, especially compared to other countries around them, but they've seemed to be doing things fairly well 
keeping those same mandates or the same uh, recommendations they've kept throughout. And right now they're a little under six cases per 100,000. Now the important part there is, especially in Sweden, looking at lessons from Sweden, is even though they're not mandating things, the Swedish people are very good about following government recommendations. And so the government has said no big groups, masks are mandatory, those types of things, and the population for the most part has said, okay, that's something that we think is a good idea. What I want to do is I want to compare this, and I apologize for not doing this earlier, but here to the United States. And remember that we had the... Uh, 20 to 22 in countries that weren't doing too well. In countries that were doing well, they had around five or six. Here in the U.S., it's right around 15 per 100,000. So we're right in the middle there. And we're heading towards that, that higher end. Lessons learned here, essentially look at what they're doing in Europe. Realize that we can't, basically, we can't let our guard down. We have to keep doing these things. I'm tired of doing them. I know you're tired of doing them. But it's better to do those now keep them going for the next few months, probably through the springtime, maybe into the summer, until we can start getting this under control. This is not something that's gonna happen very quickly, and I've talked about this before. Historically, if you look at pandemics, and this is without a vaccine, historically, if you look at pandemics, they're about two year events. We're not even a year into this, and so we still have ways to go, but we need to do what we need to do to make sure that it ends as quickly as possible as many people stay safe as possible, and people, uh, we have the less number of deaths as possible. But again, looking at the headlines, number one, a study out of Australia found that the virus in perfect lab conditions can live 28 days on some surfaces, but that doesn't really duplicate real life. But we do know it can live for hours or days in some surfaces in real life, so washing your hands is extremely important. Number two, COVAT, the coronavirus vaccine analysis team has been formed to look at it at the coronavirus vaccine data and information independently from the government so hopefully a lot more people get confidence behind the vaccine if this group comes out with information saying they think the vaccine is safe and then europe an example of where we don't want to head at least certain countries and hopefully we can use the lessons they've learned here as well to make sure that we don't basically trip over what they've tripped over over the last few uh, months going through the pandemic but now let me see if you have any questions. Do we even know how did we get coronavirus in the first place? Do we even know how we got coronavirus in the first place? No. Uh, if you're asking for specifics about where exactly it came from and how it spread from animals to humans, we have a quasi good understanding, but not a fantastic understanding. And the reason behind that is because it's very difficult to do. If you get a situation where there's, there's a few cases and you can narrow it down and trace, and this is a lot of detective work, a lot of it is done by the CDC looking around the world, and there is a group called the EIS, the Epidemiology Investigative Services, and what they do is they send out these doctors across the world, and if you've ever seen that movie Contact, there's a, a scientist in that movie exactly does that. She unfortunately dies in the movie, but she does exactly that, trying to find patient zero for this. The idea is to try and find patient zero because if you can find them, then you can kind of figure out what, what they came in contact with and possibly where it came from. The problem is by the time it came to the world's attention, there were so many cases out there, it was difficult to track patient zero, but they have an understanding of where it came from. Now, in that area, initially we thought maybe bats to humans, and now we think maybe pangolin, which is kind of like an armadillo-looking creature, kind of a cross between an armadillo and an anteater that maybe it came from a pangolin to humans uh, at that point in that area and then from there subsequently spread throughout the world. But I don't think we'll ever get a good understanding of exactly where it came from, but I think we'll have an understanding of kind of the general area. But this shows that you know, this, these are those diseases that, which historically has happened many, many times, diseases coming from animals to humans. If they come from animals to humans, not as big a deal. But once they go from animals to humans and they make, then make that next step of human-to-human -human transmission, that's when it can cause issues, and that's exactly what happened here. Why don't doctors use the same medications given to the president to stop coronavirus? So why don't doctors give the same medications given to the president to stop coronavirus? The president got three different medications. He got remdesivir. He got this other one called monoclonal antibodies from a company called Regeneron. And he got dexamethasone. Remdesivir and dexamethasone, those are standards of care right now. They're not going to stop you from getting coronavirus. But once you get coronavirus, they're going to help you get through coronavirus. Dexamethasone has shown life-saving benefits. It's reduced your chances of dying. 
if you have severe symptoms, you're on a ventilator, you're in, uh, on supplemental oxygen, you're having lung issues, dexamethasone can help in later stages of coronavirus, but not initially. And that's why you don't want to take it at home. Remdesivir is antiviral, directly attacks the virus. And that, again, too, is standard of care at this point. The other one, Regeneron, it's a monoclonal antibody made by a company called Regeneron. And essentially what it does, it jumpstarts your immune system. It is made to specifically fight coronavirus. It's antibodies that are gotten from people who survived coronavirus now have antibodies. And then those antibodies are duplicated in the lab, and they're given to patients to try and, again, jumpstart their immune system. It's kind of a bridge to the vaccine. That is seeking emergency use authorization right now. So at this point, it's used in clinical trials, or it's used on what's called a compassionate use basis, which is what the president's physicians applied for and got. And so he was able to get it that way. But as far as trying to use it to prevent coronavirus, it, that doesn't look like what it's being used for. At this point, it's being used to treat coronavirus early in the disease process. And I think at some point here in the next couple of weeks, you're going to see it get emergency use authorization. And then that more than likely will become part of the standard of care as well. But as of right now, two of the three medicines he got, most people with coronavirus that are hospitalized are getting two of those three medicines. So one of the medicines is steroids. But... Can steroids given during COVID-19 affect behavior? So the question is, can steroids during COVID-19 affect behavior? And I think part of the question behind this is because of President Trump over the past uh, four or five days has uh, had some behavior that some people thought maybe was, were a little different than what he normally is like. Um, but the thing about steroids, he was on what's called a short burst of steroids. He was on five days of steroids. Uh, he took them. Again, they're meant for later in the disease process if you have severe symptoms, especially if you have lung inflammation, to try and control your lung inflammation. One of the side effects from steroids is it does give you a sense of euphoria, almost a sense of, of, mani of mani mania, almost a manic-type sense. And so people tend to not sleep as well. They tend to feel like they're on top of the world. And then once they're off the, the steroids, they tend to get back, revert back to normal slowly. So it's not like a crashing type symptom, uh, syndrome or anything. But yes, steroids can affect behavior to a certain extent. The limited doses of steroids, again, short bursts like that typically don't affect it much. Although people will say, I felt like I was on top of the world. I felt like I could do anything, anything possible. I just felt really good on those steroids. And that's kind of one of the side effects behind them. Do you think this pandemic will be better in the winter? Do I think the pandemic will be better in the winter? No, I actually think the pandemic is going to be worse in the winter. And the reason I think it's going to be worse in the winter is because these viruses, these respiratory viruses, particularly coronavirus, influenza viruses, they like cold weather for a couple of reasons. One, they like cold weather because they are simply more active and more viable in cold weather and they're able to infect you more in that cold weather. We're not exactly sure why they like that, but it's kind of like us. We have a certain temperature range that we work best in same thing with them. Their temperature range tends to be on the cooler side. And even the study, again, I talked about the 28 days in that lab where the, the virus lived. It was in 68 degree temperature. They found if it was colder, it still lived 28 days. But if they started warming it up, that was shortened to the point where if they got it to 104 degrees or 40 degrees centigrade, that it shortened down to 24 hours. And so it likes cold weather, which is what we're coming into in our winter months, plus because of what we do. We move indoors. If you move indoors, you're less likely to social distance. And we know being outdoors, that's the fourth W, really helping ventilate, helping get that air exchange there, can really dilute out the virus and make it less likely you're, cat you're going to catch it. So number one, the virus loves cold weather. It's more active in cold weather. Number two, we move indoors, so we're closer to each other. Number three, we also tend to get sniffles, coughs, sneezes, which means we're going to be wiping our nose a lot more. We're going to be sneezing a lot more. We're going to be touching surfaces. Those sneezes and coughs are going to start spreading the virus a little bit further, might hang out in the air a little bit longer. So that combination of things is one of the reasons we think these viruses, flu, coronavirus, and other coronaviruses which cause colds we know are more active in the winter. That's why I think this will be more active in the winter as well. One of the side issues is we were hoping, in particular Dr. Fauci brought this up, that once we got through the summer here, we'd get down to a baseline of 10,000 cases, and then we'd be ready to start getting into the winter months when we'd have that second curve of coronavirus, the second wave. We never got through the first wave completely. We never really got below an average of around 40,000. There were a few days it went down to 21,000, but overall averaging around 40,000. And so th that's pushing us into this, what would have been the second wave, uh, 
at a higher level than we want it to be. So I think the winter is going to be worse than we thought it was going to be. But hopefully uh, the things we've learned as far as treating patients, as far as the things we can do to keep ourselves safe, are going to go a long way towards helping us uh, get through this. And then, of course, the vaccine that we're looking at come uh, springtime. But again, thank you very much. The headlines again in the lab. If you saw the headline, the virus can last for 28 days, but that's only in the lab under ideal conditions. In the real world, probably not quite as much. COVAT, Coronavirus Vaccine Analysis Team, is a team of independent vaccine experts that are formed outside the government to analyze vaccine data. So hopefully give you some confidence that we're getting good information about the data and we understand the safety and the effectiveness of the vaccine. And then number three, Europe. Europe are, some countries in Europe are having issues right now in having to mandate lockdowns again because they essentially opened up too soon, too robustly, and uh, didn't take the precautions that other European countries did who are keeping coronavirus cases better under control. We're, our cases are starting to move up here in the U.S., so hopefully we're learning lessons from them about what we need to do here. But the important part is that we all do the things we need to do and I'll repeat the four W's, wear a mask, watch your distance, wash your hands and windows, ventilate or stay outdoors as best you can to keep coronavirus under control. And the main point being that you, your family, your loved ones and your community all stay as happy and as healthy as you can, especially now in the midst of the pandemic. And we all do the things that we need to do to get us through this pandemic sooner rather than later. Thank you.